Welcome back to my studio. Uh, this morning, I'm gonna actually get on to the, doing the actual painting of this piece. So two episodes ago, we blocked in the composition. Yesterday, I showed you how I mix my palette for the greens and yellows and oranges. And today, I'm actually gonna start the painting. So I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna do that in real time as well and try and articulate why I'm doing what I'm doing and what brushes I'm using and that kind of thing. So stick around and we'll get to that. Okay, so I've, I'm about to start painting this and there's a few decisions that you have to make before you actually start painting. So yesterday it was actually mixing the colors out in the palette. The next thing is which brushes are you going to use? Um, if you look around my studio, I probably have about 500 brushes in here. Every one of them will make a slightly different mark than the others. Um, and so it's about choosing which brush is going to do the best job for the type of mark you want it to make. And I just know from experience for me, for this type of painting, for doing strokes that are suggestive of foliage, I like to use filberts. So filberts are kind of a long tapered brush um, that they come to a flat kind of a rounded tip as opposed to a perfectly flat tip. And they typically go a little bit bigger in the belly and then more narrow at the tip. Um, and they're very useful for making a lot of different types of strokes um, and they're, they're fairly springy. So if I push in, it will make a different stroke. If I just lightly touch the canvas, it will make a slightly different stroke. And it's generally a good idea to start with the biggest brush possible um, and then move down only when you, if you realize that brush is too big to be able to give you the kind of accuracy you need. Um, and that's generally a good rule of thumb. Okay, so I'm gonna start painting this. And when I look at my photo, so here's my photo here, I'm trying to get no reflections. The important thing at this point is, is to kind of think in terms of three dimensions, what's in front of what. Um, so I need to know, for example, are the branches, are the leaves gonna be in front of this birch tree or behind? And I've already kind of decided that these two trees, obviously they're the thickest, they're gonna be closest to us in the foreground. And the only thing that's gonna go in front of these trees is a couple cedar boughs here. So I know right off the bat, that's a no-go place for my foliage. And then I have to look at my other trees, my other um, birch trees going back. Um, and it's kind of the same thing for this one. Uh, the foliage is gonna be behind this tree it's going to be behind this tree until we get down to here. And for this tree, it's going to cut over top of it here. This tree, again, it's only going to be a little bit of the evergreens here. And for these trees over here, all of the foliage is kind of going through. The only place the birch will show is where there's no foliage over top. Um, and so for me, that's really important. When I start thinking about pathways and that, I, have, I think more in terms of where are the places I can't put the foliage, um, and then everywhere else is open. Uh, now, I, I may in fact change that though. This may, may happen when I decide, oh, you know what? It might need some leaves over top of here for the composition, but at least at the outset, I kind of know going by my photo um, where I want the foliage to be and where I don't want it to be. And I'm gonna start with the, I work kind of ass backwards compared to most artists. I start with my foreground foliage first and then paint around it. And that's called negative shape painting. So up in this top corner here, I've got some reddy yellows, and orangey yellows that are in the foreground. And I'm gonna block these in first. And I want to continually be going to different areas on my palette so that I get a variety in these yellows and oranges. And I'm also mixing these colors in with the pure colors that I have painted out on my palette. And I'm not painting leaves. I'm painting strokes of color that are suggestive of leaves 
and that's a, that's a minor but very important distinction. If you get into painting actual leaves, then it can look very uh, kind of forced and contrived. And then I'm just going to stick with these kind of orangey colors wherever I see them. In the foreground, I'm going to paint those all in at the same time. And that also helps me kind of balance out where the oranges and yellows are on the painting. And I have down here some of these some of these oranges even going into the reds. And I see I'm going to have kind of a sweeping movement from here towards the sun. This is already leading the eye down towards the sun. And then I also know as I get close to where the sun is, these yellows and oranges have to be much more intense. Um, so there's actually there's some reds up in the top right as well. And there's actually some more almost pure reds, kind of cooler reds up here. And that's a good opportunity for me to kind of echo those colors because I know they're going to appear down by the sun. And let's see, there's a few of these reds down here as well. And more of the yellowy oranges now as I get. So I did the initial kind of foreground yellows first. Now there's some of these yellow areas that appear behind the trees. So when I'm doing these, I'm just going to go up to the edge of these trees down here. But then there's also some of them that cut in front. And so with each stroke you're doing, you want to think, is this a stroke that's supposed to be suggestive of something kind of more towards the front or more towards the back? If it's towards the front, then it can overlap all your tree shapes. If it's towards the back, then it needs to go beside your tree shapes. And a little bit more of these yellows up here. Now I have the yellow and the orange coming through here, even though in my photo it kind of transitions mainly to green up here. It's not it's a good idea to not have transitions happen out of view of the of the viewer, out of sight of the viewer's eye. So by pulling some of these oranges over to this side and then making the transition to green then it, it, it this continues through it doesn't stop and then it's not a jarring um, color transition that happens out of sight of the viewer so whenever you have that happening whenever you have like a change of color that kind of happens behind an object whether it's a rock or whether it's trees or a house or whatever it's generally a good idea to pull that color to the other side and then have the color transition happen it just again it just aids in movement and it if you if you have a kind of jarring color transition that can cause the viewer's eye to kind of stop instead of continuing through and again i'm just looking just looking for most of these oranges because when i switch to the greens i don't want to have to keep switching back between green and orange because they're near complements and I'm gonna have to clean my brush out every time I make that transition. Whereas I can make the transition from red to orange to yellow and back and forth kind of numerous times without having to clean my brush and without losing the intensity of the colors because they're complementary colors. Whenever you, or sorry, they're analogous colors. Whenever you're mixing kind of analogous colors, I find it's, it's easy just to keep just maybe wiping off your brush if necessary um, and just dipping into, into new paint. But when you're switching between complements or near complements, then you pretty much it's a, have to um, clean your brush each time you switch from one to the other, which just really slows down the painting process. And aside from you know, kind of time being money, so the faster you can complete it, the better. It also just really interrupts the flow. When I get going on a painting, I get into a, a, a real flow state um, and anything I have to do that stops that, um, like going to clean a brush and then mixing new colors in my brush, it generally 
kind of takes away from that freshness and playfulness of the uh, the color. So that same thing I mentioned about the oranges and yellows continuing through the tree here. I need to do the same thing over here. So, and, I, and this is the type of thing where at first I was just reacting to what I see in my subject. But once you have, because there's nothing really to relate to composition wise until you actually have something to compare it to. Because composition, as I've talked about before, is all about relativity. Everything's relative to everything else that's kind of happened on the canvas. So the more we have going on, the more we can make a, objective decisions about what's a good decision and what's maybe not so good a decision. And again, this red that comes down here should peek out a little bit. And the same with this yellow. Okay, last little bit of oranges down here. Reds, orange and yellows up here. Again, I'm just trying to finish off most of the orangey yellows now before I switch to the greens. And I'm just trying to make sure as well that this is balanced. It's a good idea if every color that you use, if its influence appears in each quarter of the painting. And that's something I learned from Zoltan Zabel, which I found to be true. Although I also would say anything you hear me saying, if I say you should do this or you should do that, or this is a good idea, um, nothing is an absolute in painting. So question everything. Um, there's no such thing as always or never uh, in painting. Anything that I tell you, it's a good idea to do. I can also show you an example of where the exact opposite works in a specific painting. What's really important for, um, when you're painting is learning the why. Why is something a good idea or not a good idea? Uh, and then you can make the objective decision, your subjective decision yourself, whether you want to do that or not do that in your painting. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to the greens. And now I've got all of these beautiful greens out here. And this is where all that little extra time spent mixing really comes in handy. And because the greens, at least the uh, bright foliage, is further away, these are going to be smaller strokes. Um, and I'm going to, so even though this might kind of work into a mass of color, it's going to be composed of tinier strokes. And these are actually going around some of the branches um, as well as over some of them. Uh, but when we move up top here, actually, we're, we're back. These are actually in the foreground. So these are going to be bigger strokes. So that's another thing to think of when you're doing your strokes is, is it foreground or more background? And the closer it is to the foreground, likely the bigger the, bigger the stroke will be and it also is likely going to go over top of the trees. I'm going to add a little bit more of that olive -y tone in here. Just I don't want it all the same color. And there's also going to be some yellows here. I love that uh, when you mix the orange in with uh, with the greens to give you those olive tones and then you have that transition through into orange and then yellow it's just a really really pretty color combination and if you've watched more than one video of mine you know i really love color the more color the better but again that whole idea with using lots of color is to not to disrupt the unity um, and one sure way to kind of encourage that is to have all of your colors kind of mixed in with all of your colors, even if it's just just a subtle influence um, that will help it look like all the colors belong. And as we know, you saw me mix it. I've got lots of oranges, yellows and reds mixed in with my greens. And I've also mixed in some of my greens with my yellows and oranges, although to a lesser degree. So again, I'm looking at my photo. But I'm gonna, I'm, again, it's all about pathways, about moving the eye. And I'm also trying to go somewhat with, I'm not, I don't want to kind of mix 
all of these dull colors in with my kind of more the brighter neutral colors or sorry the brighter more intense colors so I do want to um, kind of get those intense colors down sooner rather than later because I don't want to have them disappear from my palette as I mix the more neutral colors in with them. And so our eye not only follows these pathways, but it follows gradations. So here we're going from orange to orangey yellow to yellow. Here we're going from kind of orangey oranges to yellows and more to yellows again. These, the greens will go from kind of more dull, darker greens at the sides and the edges, and those will transition to lighter, more intense greens. So our eye will follow the pathway, not of this, just the specific hues in general, um, but also it'll follow that transition of going from darker, more neutral greens to lighter, more intense greens. And so that whole idea of, you know, gradation and creating paths. I need to clean my brush out now. Edgar Whitney had a uh, saying that I, I like and that for the most part I think is uh, pretty good advice. And he said, never go an inch without a change in value, hue, uh, or intensity. Um, so you're either changing how light or how dark something is, you're changing the actual color, so if it's going from a pure green to a more yellow or to a more orangey green, and the intensity, whether it's going from a dull green to a brighter green. Um, and if you just continually look at changing those things, even just slightly, um, it will make your paintings more vibrant and more colorful, if that's something you're after. I actually have some other artist friends of mine who create a lot of their paintings in the more neutral muted tones and they like that. And so if that's the case, I mean, you still want to, I still think that whole idea of changing the value, intensity and hue is a good idea, but then they're gonna be much more subtle changes. Whereas for me, these are very, very bright intense colors that I like using. So those changes are gonna be much more dramatic. Um, and again, in particular, if you really like colorful paintings, um, then having that, all of these transitions from one intense color to another, and then actually mixing the colors together creates a lot of visual excitement and also allows you to maintain the unity of the painting. doing for time we're at 17 minutes um, yeah I think I'm going to call this one here um, when I come back I'll have this all blocked in you don't really need to see the whole thing um, but I hope you got the idea of what I'm thinking again it's like everything is always about first of all with the block in it's about moving the eye through the paint and creating that movement um, when it's mixing the colors it's about creating colorful variations of the colors and and maintaining the unity by mixing all having all of your colors have influence of the other colors that you're using and then when i'm actually painting uh the painting it's again i'm not painting leaves i'm painting strokes that are suggestive of leaves um, and i'm trying to create pathways of color um, pathways of value and pathways of gradation to lead the eye towards the sun and around the painting. And then that will just continue when I move to the sky and when I move to the birch trees. So I'm gonna continue on this on my own, but uh, yeah, I find it very draining to articulate what I'm doing while I'm doing it because my mind actually moves faster than my mouth. So this kind of slows me down. So I'm gonna continue on this. Um, so the next video that I do, we will have all the foliage blocked in and we'll get back to the sky. So. Uh, Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, share it with your friends. I welcome your comments and questions. I'm Tim Packer, and I thank you for your time.